Good morning. Welcome to your Tuesday edition of Cup of Cyber. Today, we have Montana on our mind. Our cup of Illy coffee is safely nestled in a Big Sky Country cup. A great way to start the day. Have you ever wondered why we do separation of duty? Uh, NIST control AC5 is the control that covers separation of duty. And today in our Cup of Cyber, we'll be covering what AC5 is all about. Welcome this morning. Uh, er, up early and Adam. Uh, today is February 4th, 2020. Today is actually National Thank a Mailman Day or uh, Mail Carrier Day, to be politically correct. Um, fun facts about the Postal Service, started in 1775 by the Second Continental Congress. Uh, many of you know the first Postmaster General was Benjamin Franklin. Uh, postage stamps were invented 1847. Uh, the Pony Express started uh, April 3rd of 1860, and the post office began city delivery in 1863 and rural delivery in 1896. Back in 1963, we started the zip code, and many of you probably should know that in 1920, the United States Postal Service made it illegal or banned sending children through the mail. Probably good facts we should know. Thank your mail carrier today, and uh, let's dive into AC5. Um, AC5 is really all about separation of duties. We're going to keep uh, one role away from another role. We're going to keep them separated. You got to keep them separated. So when we look into this control, um, Let's dive in. First of all, it's a sh one of the shorter controls in the access control family. It, it really is uh, very specific about what it does. So the control description is the organization separates, and again, we've got square brackets, and anytime we have square brackets, we have to define something. We have to assign a value, or we have to make a selection. And in this case, we're assigning a value. So in this one, we're gonna have to assign an organizationally defined individual, right? Or individuals, right? So who in the heck are we separating? We have to separate one role or one set of people or one type of, of user from another type of user, right? Um, then as always, we have to document that separation of duties. And we have to define the information system access authorizations to support the separation of duties. So what we're really saying here is we have to first, as an organization, define what types of roles we're going to separate. And then when we, we, we define that, we're going to separate that, we got to get it documented. We always, we always have to write these things down, right? So without some type of documentation, the, these controls are hard to enforce. So we want to get documented in a policy, a procedure, a standard. Something is going to tell the organization that there are certain types of roles we have to separate, right? And then we're going to define in the system access authorizations how we're going to separate them. How are we going to enforce that separation? Supplemental guidance, uh, separation of duty uh, addresses potential for abuse of authorized privileges and helps reduce the risk of male uh, malevolent activity without collusion, uh, you know, more than one person working together. Um, Separation of duty includes, for example, dividing mission functions and information system support functions among different individuals and roles, um, conducting information system support functions uh, with different individuals, and that gives some examples, um, and ensuring, secure, <laughs> ensuring security personnel administering access control functions uh, do not also administer audit functions. Wow. Um, Sometimes all week is Monday. So what we're saying here is we want to take and separate different functions, right? So in the banking world, they've had these kind of controls. In the business world, even, they've had these kind of controls for a long time. So 
we want to separate functions. So if we take a function in the, the financial world or the business world, we have something like those folks that write checks, right? So one, you have one part of the organization maybe that writes and sends checks out. Uh, and then you want to make sure that that person that's writing the checks on behalf of the business isn't able to write themselves checks and then hide the facts that the fact that they're writing themselves checks. So we have to separate functions. So one way we do that, we can say, okay, the person that writes the check, that, that drafts it up, is not authorized to, to sign the check. That's one way we could do it. That means one person writes it and the other person signs it. So we say the person that holds the check, the person that fills the check out, is not the same person that can sign the check. And then the person that signed the check doesn't have access to checks, right? That's one way we could separate this out. The other way we could separate, separate it out is we could say, okay, the person that write, writes and signs the check is not the same person that gets the bank statement. So we're making sure that I can't, as the, as the person that writes the check, I, I can't write myself a check and then cash it and get the money. And then when the bank statement comes in, hide the fact that I wrote myself the check. Um, so if we take that over into the computer world, we want to say that maybe the person that creates accounts, you know, maybe the, the, the account admin, the system admin, the person that, that creates those accounts is not able to audit the uh, or, or view or modify the audit logs, right? So um, we have a security person or, or somebody that reviews audit logs is different than the person that creates the accounts, right? So we want, and that can be, you know, a security on one side and admin on the other. It's normally the way it works. So as a system admin, I can't go in and create my own administrative account and then go in the logs and delete those logs out, hiding the fact that I have a second administrator account. Um, and it talks in here about, you know, earlier we talked about collusion, right? So the only way, if we have this separation of duties, the only way we can circumvent this control is if I go to the person that's doing the monitoring of the logs and we work together, we say, hey, I'll create you a second account and, and myself a second account. When they come in the logs, you delete them out. That way, if we ever get fired, we can go back in the system and cause havoc. Um, that's really the only way this happens. We, that's collusion. So we have to have other controls to take care of collusion. This one separates, this control separates out the fact that as an administrator, I can't go in create my own account, and then go into the logs and delete out the fact that I created the account, right? So it's an important control, and we see it not just in, in those couple examples. We see it in a lot of other places within the system, right? Um, and it's maybe in um, configuration management, right? The person that, that adds the, that configures the system is not maybe the same person that that approves what the configuration is. Um, or we see it in development, right? Um, developers, a lot of times, are not allowed on the production system, right? Depend on your organization. You have to develop in a development environment, create that, that package, and then hand it over to somebody else, and they move it onto the production environment. So we, we want to separate out as much as we can, right? Oops, I'll not overlay there the stuff there. So um, this control is related to AC3, AC6, PE3, PE4, PS2. Um, there are no control enhancements with this is the all this is all there is to this control. Um, there's no enhancements to go on. Um, and uh, it has no references, right? But there's tons of references we can look at in system administration documentation and security documentation. NIST doesn't define any. Um, the family, of course, AC, uh, the AC family or the access control family. Um, this is a P1 implementation, which of course doesn't mean it's criticality, it just means in the order of implementing controls, we do P1s first and then P2s and then P3s and then P0s, just as a logical progression. Not that this is more important than a P2 control, it just means logically it would come first um, if we're building a baseline, according to NIST, um, this will be, uh, it's, it's, it's not that it's not applicable. NIST calls it not applicable at the low, low baseline. Um, we could always add it in 
at, in our tailoring process, we could always add this control into the low baseline, but by default, it's not applicable. It doesn't it doesn't apply to the the standard low baseline for NIST. Um, at the moderate level, we will implement AC5 as it is. There's no enhancement, so you just get AC5. And obviously at high, we're going to implement it as well. So that is our rundown of AC5. Hopefully it helps. Um, it's in the AC family. It is one of the, the smaller controls. It's a little, uh, hopefully more easy to understand now that we've kind of talked through it. Um, Love to see how you guys, you know, is there something, some story you've got about AC5? Did you have any troubles implementing AC5 or maybe this is the first time you're hearing about it? Does it make sense or is there some examples you'd like to give? Throw them down in the comments below. We'd love to hear what you have to say about fun things, fun facts about AC5. Uh, remember, it's uh, prohibited, it's banned to send children through the mail. Um, we learned that. And thank your mail carrier today. Um, like, comment, and subscribe so you know when we're putting out new videos. Um, love to see your comments. And uh, as always, join us tomorrow for another Cup of Cyber.